Welcome, I'm David Eicholtz at David Richard Gallery located in New York City. And today I'm with Will Staple. Staples? <laughs> I always forget that in S. Anyway, um, so uh, this is an exhibition of almost all new work, uh, some recent, but mostly new work um, that Will's created over the past year uh, in upstate New York. And the exhibition is called uh, Pastoral Pictures. And um, what I'd like to do today is, and, and, you know, normally we, when we talk about these videos, is go through, um, you know, the, a little bit of process, a little bit of history, a little bit of influence, and some specifics. Uh, there's a lot of really interesting things with these paintings. Um, so for those of you who are listening, um, this is going to be posted on um, YouTube and on the gallery website, so we'd appreciate you liking the videos and uh, passing them along to people, that'd be great. And also, they will be posted um, with links uh, on Instagram and, and Facebook as well. So, um, so Will, um, these paintings, and there's also a, a press release and essay on the website if you want to read in more detail some of the background and just some context setting for this. But what I'd like to talk about today is, for our gallery, this is a little bit different imagery. Um, we're a painting gallery, so these are paintings. Um, and we mostly are uh, post-war abstraction and um, you know, largely uh, movements that emerged in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and, uh, and largely American, but uh, we also ha have a lot of other you know, sort of international artists. And so these definitely fit in that genre, except that there's a lot of figures. And, but it was interesting when we were talking, um, you consider these paintings abstractions yourself, and we'll get into that. But the one thing um, that struck me and that, I, that appealed to me so much about them was the fact that there's a very modernist sort of feel to them. There's also a lot of, um, the, your use of color, reminds me a lot of uh, some, you know, sort of impressionist and early modern uh, work. But at the same time, there's such a contemporary freshness about them that is, it's this sort of, uh, and, and talking to you more, you know, what influences you and, and spin, there's a, definitely a contemporary, you know, element. And that's what I think I'd like uh, for you to just talk about in your own words is, uh, is you know, this imagery. And it's been kind of consistent, you said, postgraduate work, um, this sort of imagery and scale, which are largely, you know, easel size and, and more intimate sort of paintings. This one, uh, you said, was probably the largest you've done in a long, long, long time. And um, I forget the measurements. This is something like... It's 5242. 5242. And then a lot of them are, are these really small, really terrific pieces. And even the really small ones, what I like about the paintings is there's a lot there visually. There's, there's a lot happening on them. And so they really hold themselves. And, um, and they're generally a, a very detailed aspect or element. So it makes them very abstract inherently. Um, but, you know, really interesting and compelling. And also just your surfaces... And uh, a lot of the things you do, like the literalism, like where you actually, the dimensionality, and actually bring in um, bark, actual tree bark, for the, uh, the tree itself, which is very interesting. But what I'd like to do is, just sort of hear in your words, about this, um, you consider them abstractions, but yet you, you do like figurative and representational elements and sort of, you know, um, sort of a slightly more traditional pictorial feel in your work. And I just would like to know um, how you kind of came about this approach and this imagery vis-a-vis, -vis, you know, hyper-realism or, you know, pure abstraction or, you know, something like that. I just was kind of curious sort of, you know, because it's not like they're in a true modernist tradition, but there is definitely seems to be an influence. I'm just kind of curious in your words to, if you'd speak about that. Yeah, um, well, as far as the idea of modernism, I mean, I never really bought into the postmodern you know, when I was in grad school and undergrad uh, as being a, really something real. Or, uh, 
more of a theoretical thing that I thought was more suited to literature or other disciplines. And anytime anyone tried to explain it, postmodernism to me, as I was supposedly growing up as an artist in it, it never made any sense. And so over time, I just didn't really see any difference. But I didn't really think. So it, eventually, I just felt like, well, it's still it's just modernism. And so um, I don't I don't mean that I it's not like something I'm a call to action or anything mm -hmm. that I'm trying to convince anyone. But that's just how I personally feel about it. And um, but it's also not in. I don't consciously think about like the modern tradition when I work make this work. Um, it's more just I've absorbed so much. Um, you know, I look at paintings and I think about it a lot, obviously. And for me, it's more um, working within a tradition and, and kind of like a continuum with that and experimenting with it, like in, in the true sense of what experimentation means, like do these things hold up? You know, if you play with an idea or a, a, some kind of pictorial um, precedent, does it hold up? You mm -hmm. know, um, so a lot of it's experimenting um, with with that uh, and, and and thinking about pictorial ideas that I that interest me or formal ideas that interest me and in and just trying to be inventive with it um, and, and thinking about why does it interest me and what can I contribute to that. Mm -hmm. So that's really, and, and that's probably maybe, I mean, I think of modernism, like particularly in uh, the you know, late 19th century, 20th century, as more of like always constant progression, like not really looking back. And, and that kept on, to me, escalating into what a lot of work was in the 60s and 70s is always like, just be progressive and avant-garde. And I've never really been interested in that. So that, that part of modernism, the idea of avant-garde is not interesting to me. Like usually the modern artists, people that are put into that uh, category are the ones that actually shun, like Jean Elion and, and Duran, were you know, avant-gardists who all of a sudden turned their back on it and then went to more uh, conventional motifs, uh, mo motifs and, and approaches, but yet they were really inventive, and um, I'm, I'm more sympathetic with that. So that's so a non-avant-garde aspect of modernism. Is that what you're? Yeah, okay. yeah, and it's not like the idea of being a traditionalist or just right. like conventional. But I, I, I'm not really interested in trying to like um, break through the boundaries, you know, like I'm more interested in like pushing at the edges. Yeah, so you're not really so interested in pure formal concerns like around pure color or geometry or things like that, even though within snippets of yours, you see pure abstractions and you know, something that you could identify as, oh, that could be a color field or geometric painting or something Hans Hoffman would have done or whatever. Um, so there's elements within your work, and, and again, I think that's a good the way you put it. It sort of, you push at the edge of it within the context, but at the end of the day, you like picture making and, um, and, and things that, that, uh, have, that resonate with people. Is that fair? Well, I mean, a lot of it's just things that I like to look at. Right. Um, and I want to, um, there might be something specific in a scene, an image, image that I'm that uh, strikes me, and I really don't care about the rest of it. So mm -hmm. I want to get that. Um, so maybe a certain way the light might look on the leaves of a tree, and then I don't want to paint it obviously the way it might, the convention of doing that. So then I start thinking about ways I can try to represent that or the way uh, a figure holds its weight or like maybe something about like 
so, like the, the, the neck or the little mm -hmm. details that I'm interested in capturing actually the, because it's interesting to me, but then right. the rest of it isn't. So, um, th so there's certain things in all these pictures, I think, that I can look at and go, you know, yeah, I wanted to get that particular thing. Well, I think but then the rest of it yeah. is just uh, solving the problems that, uh, that come up in making a painting, formal problems, um, and then trying to figure out how not to be just like, I try not to repeat myself, you know. Um, I, you know, if I feel very comfortable in something, I don't, that's usually to me, then I need to change that. Like Move on to something else. Mess it up somehow, I'm like not just get into a comfort zone. Right. Um, the, and color, uh, I've always been suspicious of color. So I try to, I, I, I try not to, um, I try not to do what I know would be the most appealing thing or like, and I, and I think about it that uh, it's intuitively and also with my knowledge of color theory. Um, although I don't want it to be like really off-putting. I mean, it's like right. colors are really, and that's what makes me suspicious of it. So I try not to, so I try to do things like a little different. I, there's a painting there where I was thinking about how to, to play with something that I, I knew, like col a color scheme that I knew might be actually a little off-putting, mm -hmm. but it was really interesting to me and, and working it so that it um, coalesces with the whole composition and, yeah. and doesn't stick out as, some, as a gesture of some sort. Right. Well, I've noticed that, that as you say that, because we haven't really talked much about color, although I've mentioned to you that I think what holds your paintings together is a lot of times color because it sets the tone. So I see you using this color as it sort of sets a mood or a tone or a highlight of something. Um, like, you know, this is way off, you know, atmospherically in the distance, this body of water. But that brilliance of the blue, you know, really draws your eye to it very quickly, even though what we're looking at is largely is the detail of the tree. So I don't know if you noticed that or not, but at least that's the way it affects me when I look at it. But I do notice your use of color a lot. And this is a good example too with this one, which is the little bit of blue and then that <clears throat> really interesting red, you know, um, that again, it gets back to what, you, what you're saying is when you look at something, when you're out in the field and you're looking at like leaves in particular, and depending on where the sun is that in the day and hitting it, you do see different spectral aspects, you know, in a canopy as opposed to green. You know, it's variations on green. And so, um, but no, I, I know what you're saying. I, you do have sometimes a tertiary color or something come up that isn't necessarily a color found in nature. But again, when you're, you know, out in the field, sometimes you do see other colors that are, instead of just a pure, you know, dark green, light green, or you know, blue. So that's how I well, sort I of Well, I try interpret. not to, I mean, because of these, these uh, have recognizable images, like the motifs are recognizable. I, I, I don't um, use any kind of descriptive color. Like, it's very rare that I actually am trying to des describe the color that might be in, from the original source. And most of, um, and I, when I make this work, it's from charcoal drawings. Uh, sometimes pastel drawings have color, but most of the times it's charcoal drawings. The color oh, is see. completely invented. Gotcha. Um, but it, things like how light hits leaves is interesting to me, and and playing with, dealing with that with uh, textures. Um, but there's nothing, as you point out, none, none of this. In fact, this is all of this color here came uh, much later in the development of this painting. In fact, I thought I had finished this painting and this was mostly just uh, the, the canvas. And then having looked, I never showed it, so I had it with in the studio for a very long time and looked at it a lot and eventually became dissatisfied with it. And then just went and so this, a lot of this and then the, any kind of color interventions that came because of this that went into here happened. Well, the brilliance of the, in this particular green 
which there's not a lot of, but it is sort of peppered throughout, really ties with the brilliance of this blue. Brilliance isn't the right word. It's the only one coming to my mind at the moment. <laughs> but, um, you know, but there's a, a brightness, you know, and the, they're sort of in this similar value. I don't know if you noticed that or not, or if that was intentional. But it kind of helps pull your eye through. Well, that's, that's exactly what. Yeah. So once I started, because these are pretty saturated, and, mm -hmm. and it's like, uh, you know, complement, you know, yellow over the violet is very complex. It's complementary color scheme, and then the orange with this blue, and then contrasting colors with yellow and blue. Yeah. So it was really strong, and then so I needed to uh, guide the the eye somehow up yeah. through this. And, and it so does it worse. Yeah. Uh, and so that's why you would have I brought in some warm colors and then cooler greens in there, so that it wouldn't be overpowered by that. And so that's just like, I mean, that's an example of the kind of problem solving that yeah. happens. It's purely formal, you know, in its essence. And, and it has really nothing to do with the, the painting. It's it has nothing to do with the subject. Having a su successful composition. Yeah. Yeah.